If IKEA is the global face of Sweden, Walmart might be America's. But despite apparently being one of the country's most patriotic brands, over half of all Walmarts are located outside the United States. Its 10,500 stores are scattered across 24 countries, 46 brands, and 4 continents. From Botswana and El Salvador to the strange and exotic lands of Ohio. Target, on the other hand, operates in just one country. In its entire 120-year history, it only once tried to expand overseas. In a mere two years, Target opened over 100 stores in Canada, failed spectacularly, and became a textbook $7 billion example of what not to do. It was such a disaster, in fact, that someone wrote an actual two-act play reenacting the events. It was even performed in one of its abandoned stores. Sponsored by Nebula, the platform created, owned, and loved by creators. Sign up for exclusive, early, and bonus content from Polymatter and hundreds of other channels you're guaranteed to love. The Greek tragedy known as Target Canada begins with a company called Zellers. Non-Canadians can think of Zellers like a colder, more polite version of Kmart a large national chain of discount department stores. And like Kmart, it was, by the early 2010s, more of a 90s time capsule than an actual store. But to its credit, rather than merely watch as its brand slowly aged into inevitable bankruptcy, like a certain company whose name rhymes with Spears, it threw in the towel and sold its only asset that still had value, land. The Zeller's name may not have meant much, but its nearly 200 leases certainly did. Meanwhile, Target was rapidly approaching saturation in America. After nearly two decades of 8% average growth, only 10 new stores were built in all of 2010. And where better to expand to than its friendly northern neighbor, the one just 225 miles from Target's corporate headquarters. Besides the obvious cultural and linguistic overlap, about 300,000 people cross what is the longest border in the world each day. The company estimated that one in every 10 Canadians had shopped at an American Target during the previous year. Besides, many US corporations have done well up north. Of Canada's top 10 retailers by revenue, five are American. This was not, all of this is to say, a crazy idea. With similar demographics, pre-existing brand awareness, and relatively few cultural differences, Target Canada had everything going for it. The only thing holding it back was the size of its stores. There just aren't that many 1 to 200,000 square foot buildings with Pentagon-sized parking lots. Then along came Zellers. This was the opportunity Target had been waiting for. In 2011, Target paid 1.8 billion Canadian dollars to buy 189 Zeller stores, 54 of which it immediately resold to other companies, including none other than its good friend Walmart. There was, however, one major catch. From the moment the deal was signed, the clock was ticking. Not only was every day spent cleaning, remodeling, and renovating these stores a day it wasn't making money, but Target bought only the leases, not the land outright. They still had to deal with landlords. Landlords who weren't too keen on letting these huge buildings sit empty, or worse, bustling with construction for years on end. To avoid deterring shoppers from other stores in the area, it all had to happen fast really fast. Bringing these retail museums into the 21st century required more than a fresh coat of paint. About 10 to 11 million dollars worth of work for each location. Still, Target trudged ahead on what it called Project Bacon, starting with the launch of three Ontario stores in March of 2013. Their signs, which read, were open, mostly, hinted at the disaster soon to come. 
For the next 10 months, Target opened one new Canadian store every two days on average. It was the quickest expansion in company history, a feat that continued through 2014. But first, Target had a serious problem. It wasn't a lack of demand. Canadians were eager to give the company a chance. The problem was a lack of inventory. Shelf after shelf sat totally empty. One week, almost every item featured on Target's promotional flyer was out of stock. With nothing to buy, it's no wonder Target's Canadian stores sold far less merchandise than their American counterparts. It all traced back to a single decision made months earlier. And to understand why, we'll need to take a brief detour into everyone's favorite dinner table topic, the wonderful world of enterprise software. And it's only right that you hear this in the form of a PowerPoint. Huge billion dollar mega corporations such as, for example, e.g. Target are simply too big for any one person to keep track of. So naturally, they turn to computers. More specifically, something called ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning. You can think of ERP like the mother of all Excel spreadsheets. For the kids, an all-knowing, all-seeing Notion dashboard. Your company's ERP system knows how many fractions of a cent it costs to ship this lamp from distribution center to store, how many different colors this couch comes in, and at what exact point to reorder more dark blue oversized throw blankets based on the time of year, recent sales, and diesel prices. Simply put, ERP is the brain of a giant corporation. Target already had its own custom ERP built for America, but it was designed to work only in English with US dollars, inches, and feet. So, rather than trying to jury-rig its American system, Target opted to start fresh to buy a new ERP called SAP. Spoiler alert, this was a terrible idea. Now, back to your regular scheduled programming. To Target executives, this sounded like the best, most sensible long-term decision. Better to rip off the band-aid quickly by switching to the software used by all the Fortune 500 companies the one trusted by Disney and Burger King and Coca-Cola. To anyone in the tech industry, however, this was an obvious recipe for disaster. The first thing to understand about SAP is how it makes money. Like many enterprise software companies, it's just as much in the consulting business as it is in the writing software business. In fact, providing support can be so profitable that it's not unheard of for companies to give away their software for free. This, for instance, is SAP's third quarter 2022 investor report. You can see that at least 38% of its revenue came from software support. Anyone who's ever had the misfortune of using enterprise software knows the secret. When the people, executives, who buy the software don't themselves use it, it sucks. But because SAP also makes a huge chunk of its money from support, it's even worse. How much incentive do they really have to make it easy to use? Now, the point is not that SAP doesn't have its uses. There's a reason so many companies buy it. When ERP systems work, they can do things no human could possibly do. And if SAP weren't dependable, Disney wouldn't be using them. But for them to be dependable, the data you feed them has to be perfect. Garbage in, garbage out. And by data, we're talking about the width, height, length, color, weight, quantity, description, price, and so on for every last one of the 75,000 unique items sold by Target. Now add French, an entirely different system of measurement, and a new currency to the mix, not to mention the difficulty of learning to use SAP, and you can see how this was fundamentally incompatible with Target Canada's extremely tight deadline. Software, famously, is finished when it's finished. Even on the best of days, deadlines, schedules, and roadmaps are just wishful thinking. Implementing an ERP is no different. 
However long you think it might take, add a couple years, and congratulations, you've discovered the best case scenario. Sobeys, Canada's second largest supermarket, gave up on SAP despite spending four years and $89 million after its databases were shut down for five days. Another company's transition took two years longer than expected. So you can probably guess what happened when Target Canada tried to do the whole thing in two years. Complete, unmitigated disaster. While its store shelves sat empty, products piled up in distribution centers. Target had all the inventory it needed. It just didn't know where. Eventually, the company was forced to rent extra storage space. It soon discovered the culprit. A mere 30% of the information entered into the system was accurate. The other 70% might be measured in inches, misspelled, or simply missing. Faced with no other option, the entire Target merchandising team spent days manually verifying the information for all 75,000 products. On top of this, analysts, whose performance was measured based on their ability to keep products in stock, had completely turned off the automatic replenishment system so they wouldn't be penalized. Target wasn't just flying blind, its gauges were feeding it false information. How could it possibly take off successfully under those conditions? Now, as bad as this was, and it was bad, it probably wasn't fatal. Supply chains are just plain hard, and it always takes time for companies to acclimate to a new environment. Nor was it any big scandal that Target's prices were about 15% higher in Canada. The country is about nine times less densely populated than the United States, which makes it much more expensive to get products into stores. Every last item for all 133 stores was sourced from one of just three distribution centers in Milton, Balzac, and Cornwall. The latter, therefore, had to ship products as far away as St. John's, Newfoundland, a 1,600-mile, 33-hour drive and ferry ride away. Not to mention, fuel is more expensive in Canada. But for prices to be visibly higher and for shelves to be routinely empty was simply a stretch too far. By 2014, just 18% of surveyed Canadians said they were very satisfied with the company. Above all, though, the true fatal flaw in Target's plan, the real root of its problems, was the deal with Zellers. Had it tested the market with one or two stores to begin with, like J. Crew or Nordstrom did, it would have had the necessary focus to correct any speed bumps and learn from them. Instead, Sparks soon turned into a 133-store forest fire. It was too much, too fast. It also didn't help that many of these stores were in subpar locations. When it entered Canada, Target wasn't Target. It was a fresh coat of paint over a former Kmart. All the shiny bright red spheres in the world couldn't make up for the fact that these buildings were situated in rundown strip malls and C-class shopping centers. The company lost $940 million in the first year alone, and the problem only compounded from there. So, after a widely publicized data breach, followed by a couple of lackluster holiday seasons, the bread and butter of retail, Target Canada looked for an exit. And on April 1st, 2015, just 757 days after the first store opened, Target announced it was leaving Canada. Despite spending $7 billion, hiring 17,000 employees, and taking over 133 stores, it left with hardly a trace. This was the Zeller's liquidation sale in 2011. And this was the Target liquidation sale, possibly at the very same location, just a few short years later. One store in Ottawa was completely finished but unopened at the time. The pristine, untouched Target was sold to Walmart, along with dozens of others. And Canadians, 75% of whom live less than 100 miles from America, quietly went back to crossing the border. It was as if one of the biggest disasters in retail history never happened. 
One thing that I hope will leave an impression is my video debunking the myth that China lifted 800 million people out of poverty. This persistent myth has been used as a sort of get out of jail free card by the authorities in Beijing. There's a dark history behind this claim, one that would surely get demonetized on YouTube. And that's precisely why we created Nebula, the streaming platform built by and for independent creators. There are no ads, videos like mine are available days earlier, and you get exclusive access to content that will never air on YouTube. Content like my six-part series China Actually, Neo's Underexposure, or Real Life Lore's Modern Conflicts. Personally, I check the front page of Nebula several times a day, and I am amazed by how often new exclusive original content is released. All these came out in just the last few weeks, for instance. Now, normally, Nebula costs $5 a month, but you can get it for just half that by signing up for a year with the link on screen or in the description now. That's just $2.50 a month for loads of exclusive content you'll love.